Hello, I'm Alice Lanyardo of The Voice of Russia in London. Ballet superstars came to London this Sunday for a gala in honour of Anna Pavlova, the Russian ballerina, making her home in London a hundred years ago. But the name Anna Pavlova means little to anyone who's not involved in the ballet world. Many will only know of the sweet meringue dessert named after the ballerina. I talked to Rupert Christiansen, the ballet critic for the Mail on Sunday, to explain how in her heyday Pavlova was a huge celebrity who today would be on the cover of Hello and Heat magazine. I started by asking just how big a celebrity Pavlova was in her day. She was an extraordinary celebrity all through those years after the First World War. I mean, I think it's fair to say she was one of the most famous women on earth. And one reason for that is that she was jolly busy. She danced almost every night somewhere. She was almost constantly on the road. She would dance anywhere that anyone asked her to, even if it was the end of the pier or some grotty old town hall. She'd be up there, she'd do it. She just lived to dance. That sounds like quite an exhausting lifestyle, as if she couldn't stop dancing. She couldn't stop dancing, and in the end, that did for her, because... She was told that she needed an operation because she had very bad pneumonia and she was told that the operation could be successful and save her life but it would ruin her breathing and it would mean that she wouldn't be able to dance any longer and she said, no, I'm sorry. To me, dancing is life and she died three days later. She died very young, didn't she? Only, only at the age of 49. But when, when she was young and when she was at the height of of her career. Why was she so famous? That's a very difficult question because there is some film of her and the trouble is it flickers terribly and the speed isn't quite right and the lighting's not very good so you don't get a very good impression of what her dancing was like. But the great dance critics of the time were fascinated by her lightness of touch and the fact that she had very, very long limbs, unusually long arms and legs, and a beautiful elongated neck, which she used to, to great effect. And before that, actually, ballerinas had mostly been rather tubby little creatures uh, with quite fat legs and round shoulders. And Pavlova was something much more, much more ethereal, um, with this sort of unearthly grace which meant that she was a, a wonderful interpreter of butterflies and snowflakes and sylphs and ghosts. You know, and the, these roles made up a lot of her repertory. So those roles suited her more than, say, the main role in Sleeping Beauty or the Swans in Swan Lake? I don't think she ever danced Swan Lake ever in her career. When she was in Russia in her very early years, before she left in 1912, she did dance some of those big classical roles, but that wasn't ever what she was really famous for. What she became famous for were these little dainty divertissements, I don't know what, how you would describe them exactly, they're like sort of bambouche, they're like little sweets. She would come on and she'd dance for three or four minutes, she'd flap around and float around, often to very silly, tinkly little music. She didn't like modern music. She didn't like modernism in any way. She was an entertainer, actually. And when you say she was famous, what did that mean? Did people crowd the theatres, throw things on stage? What was it like after the First World War? Oh, good God, she was famous. You know, she travelled all the way round the world, and I mean all the way round the world. She went to Australia and New Zealand... And that is where, in fact, the pavlova dessert was invented in Australia. She went all the way around South America. She was endlessly around North America in these great train journeys she made from West Coast to East Coast to East Coast to West Coast, up through Canada and all around Europe. But she, she never went back to Russia again. And, of course, she moved to London in 1912 then and settled in Golders Green, this is also the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the house she lived in. Is the house a place of pilgrimage for ballet fans? It is. Unfortunately, it's not open to the public very often. I think it's open on Sunday afternoons or maybe Fridays as well, I'm not sure. But there's a ballet studio there, which in a way is the most important thing, because I feel that's what she would really have liked. 
Um, she was a good teacher herself. She was always encouraging young dancers. And I think Ivy House, this place that she lived in and, and loved in Hampstead Heath, near Hampstead Heath, not that she was there very much, it has to say, um, I think she'd be delighted to know that you could still see dance there. Now, The Dying Swan is a piece that was choreographed in 1905, especially for Anna Pavlova. Many ballerinas have taken on the role since then. Rupert, you've been watching ballet performances since the 1960s. Which ballerinas have been the most successful in dancing this piece, in your opinion, and why? It's very, very tricky, The Dying Swan, because... Again, there is film of Pavlova dancing it, and it's very, very moving, although it's not a very, very satisfactory film. The only dancer I have ever seen who really convinced me in the role was the wonderful Russian ballerina Yuliana Lopatkina from St. Petersburg, the Mariinsky Ballet. And it's very, very exciting that I think at this gala on March the 4th at the London Coliseum, I have heard that she's going to be dancing The Dying Swan. Are there any particular dancers or pieces you're looking forward to in the gala? Well, apart from Lepatkina's appearance, and for me, Lepatkina is the modern Pavlova. She's not actually like Pavlova in personality, but she is of that stature. There's also the wonderful Russian ballerina, uh, Moscow ballerina Svetlana Zakharova from the Bolshoi. Several stars from uh, La Scala Milan and the Paris Ballet, both superb companies. And from London's own Royal Ballet, the fabulous Spanish ballerina Tamara Rojo. Now, people have different opinions, don't they, about ballet galas. Are they quite a difficult thing to pull off? Oh, I think ballet galas are very, very difficult to pull off, mainly because everybody flies in that morning and they'll do a quick class, and in the afternoon, a quick rehearsal, there'll be a quick run-through. But really, there's no time to put things together properly. Um, and they often overrun horribly. You know, they tell, tell you when you go in that it'll all be over by half past nine, and at 11 o'clock, you're still there, and it's more to come. Why does that matter? If you've got stars like Yuliana Lopatkina from the Marinsky, surely they can just come in and do things straight off, or am I mistaken? Well, it's just very difficult to time these things, and something always goes wrong with the stage equipment, or they start late, or the interval goes on too long, or there's a chapter of accidents in every single gala. Quite funny sometimes, I have to say. But come 11 o'clock, I'm afraid I want my dinner. That was Rupert Christiansen talking to me, Alice Lanyado, about ballet legend Anna Pavlova.